Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, listen, we got a guest speaker this morning, Brother James Chagy and his wife, uh, Melissa, right? I'm bad with names, but I got it. Um, and uh, they're, they're missionaries to Kenya. Brother James was born in Kenya, amen, born and raised in Kenya. And you're, you're going to be amazed because the brother speaks better English than I do. Now, that's not saying a lot. I mean, I'm just saying, like, I was like, dude, how how you speak English so well? No, because we got a missionary to Mexico, and you, look, I got to translate this dude's English for, for people. No, really, I do. Somebody, while well, standing outside talking, and was, well, I'm not going to say who it was, but he's like, I don't even understand it, man. Whenever he talks, I just shake my head, yeah. You're not going to have that problem with Brother James, man. He speaks perfect English. But he, I said, I said, how in the world you speak English better than me? He's like, man, they make us learn English when we like three years old. It's in the schools. So praise God. The brother was born and raised in Kenya. Amen. His wife, Melissa, was from, is from California, right? She's from Cali, dude. And uh, she went over there on a mission trip, and they met. Amen. And y'all got married in Kenya? No, he, she brought him back, brought him to the West Coast, like my daddy said, to the land of milk and honey. We won't tell y'all that story about my experience with California, okay? He said he thought he was going to the land of milk and honey. But anyway, uh, she brought him back, and they got married in California. Is that correct? And then y'all went back, and y'all spent a few, uh, seven years over there? No. Okay. How many years? Well, we just went back in September to do full-time mission. Gotcha, gotcha. Amen. And then you had the baby. You had to come, came back to the States. So it, is it a little girl or a boy? A little girl. So she can run for president, right? She was born on, pre, on, on American soil. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish that over anybody's child, but I'm just saying she can if she do, chooses to. Praise God. So, and then y'all are get, y'all getting ready to head back. Amen. So missionaries to Kenya, brother James Chagy. Got the handheld mic for you, brother. Come up here. Share your story. Share the gospel with the people. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Give him a warm hand clap. Amen. Praise the Lord. Pastor Matt. You <laughs> he said a lot about me. I don't know, probably I should go uh, straight to the preaching because he already did my introduction. So, <laughs> so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Pastor Matt and Danielle for inviting us here today to this church. I am so grateful for being given this opportunity to come here and in Patterson. Is, it's Patterson, right? Hallelujah. I got it right. Hallelujah. Patterson, Louisiana. And um, I'm just grateful to be amongst brothers and sisters in Christ who are here, who have such a loving spirit, who love God, and who are here today. And thank you, Pastor, for opening up this pulpit. Thank you for uh, giving me this mic and giving me this opportunity to speak to the congregation. So to just give you a little bit of background about myself, like what Pastor Matt said, um, born and raised in Kenya all my life, and um, uh, uh, was neck deep in religion, was neck deep in the word of faith doctrine. Uh, name it, claim it, grab it, blab it. That's how uh, Mike Musrow says it. I was there neck deep in it. Uh, there, was a pers there was a specific pastor who came to our church one day, and he said, uh, if you want to be a millionaire in this church, please raise your hand. So I was the first one to raise my hand, and he was like, okay, young man, you and the other people who are standing uh, standing up, you're going to be millionaires. And I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm still waiting to be, to be a millionaire. <laughs> I haven't become a millionaire. So um, 2013, uh, 2013 is when um, my wife came. Uh, 2012, the end of 2012 is when my wife came to America. We met, and then, uh, as in when I, when I was talking to her, she was like, she's nodding her head. <laughs> oh, Kenya. Oh, hallelujah. That's why I have my wife there to correct me when, I'm, when I get off track. <laughs> Welcome to America. <laughs> uh, so I met her uh, in Kenya, and then um, we talked for a while. She stayed in Kenya for like a week, and I approached her, and I told her, that uh, in Kenya, we have a cultural practice that uh, we hug people that we love and we appreciate. So can I give you a hug? And she said, no, I, I'm not going to give you a hug. So she stood me up the first week, and I was like, okay, no problem. So I, when I was talking to her, 
uh, during the last time that she was there, she went, she went to Z Zambia, I think so, Zambia, and then she went back to the States. And then after that, we started communicating on social media, Facebook, and then the hi turned into I do. Hallelujah. And then she came in 2013, I believe, in, in J July or August, and then she said, I am not leaving this country until I take you to America until we process our paperwork. Uh, how many of you have ever watched this, this show called uh, 90 Day Fiance? 90 Day Fiance? Yeah, before it was uh, televised and being dramatized, we were that couple. We were that couple. So she came, she's a woman full of faith. She has, I usually piggyback off of her faith because she's a woman of faith. So she stayed in, she stayed in Kenya. We, we waited until that process was cleared through. And then in le the latter part of December in, uh, in 2013, then we booked a flight and we came to America. And then the land of milk and honey, when I went to California, I didn't want, want to go back. I wanted to stay in America. Usually, this is, a, this is a thought process, and I believe that people from Mexico, people who are coming from the third world country, people who are coming from Africa, when they come to America, they, they usually have this notion uh, behind their head that this is a land of milk and honey. They don't want to go back. This is the place where I'm gonna have, I'm gonna drive a nice car, I'm gonna have a nice home, I'm gonna live a comfortable life. But this is the thing, is that even though I had, I got to own my vehicle, even though I was living in a nice place in California, the Lord came knocking. But God, but God, when God steps in, all your plans go out the window. When God comes in and he says, I want you to do such and such a, th such and such a thing, I want you to go to such and such a place, your plans go out the window because it's, not on, it's no longer your will, but it, but it is his will. It is his will. So I just want to give you a brief uh, um, story about um, how I got introduced with the telecast. In 2016, coming home from work, I saw my beautiful wife watching Brother Swaggart on TV. And uh, I told my wife, turn off this garbage. I don't want to hear it. So the pride and the arrogance, the audacity that this brother had <laughs> to tell Brother Swaggart that. <laughs> so the second day, coming home from work, I sat down and I saw her watching the telecast. And I said to myself, you know what, let me put my pride aside, my preconceived notion aside. Let me sit down. Let me listen to what this man has to say. And as soon as I sat down, and he was actually talking about uh, uh, the, the um, he was actually opening up justification by faith, let alone talking about sanctification, but just justification by faith. The answer that you seek is found in the cross. The solution that you seek is found in the cross. The answer that you seek is found only in the cross. And as soon as he finished talking, I stood up, and I was sitting on the, co I was sitting on the coffee table in the living room, and I stood up, and I was like, God, salvation cannot be this simple. Salvation cannot be this simple. I have worked and toiled in my Christian life. I believe in fasting. I believe in prayer. I believe in so many church activities to get myself right with you. And this man here on TV is telling me that I only have to believe. This is a lie. So I was pacing back and forth in my living room, and I was like, God, you got to tell me if what this man is saying is true. Because if it is true, then he's changed my whole mindset. And I have to, everything that I've learned in my past, I should put it in the trash bin, and I should relearn the whole Christian life all over again. So the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and this is what he said. Whatever this man is saying is true. Sit down and listen. From that time then on in 2016, I have become a disciple of the ministry, Brother Swaggart, and I love his material. Um, I have been fortunate enough to go to um, Bible school like my brother, Pastor Matt. He's a, he's a Bible scholar, and I, and I really appreciate him so much, him along with uh, other brothers that I learned from as a young minister. Uh, but I have been a disciple, not only of the ministry, but also listening to the Holy Spirit. And I value, I value books, I value uh, to study reading commentaries. And I'm, I regard myself as a student of the Bible, a student of the Bible. And I believe that all of us in the church actually should attain to that type of uh, uh, heart to be students of the word of God. So I have the pictures that are put up over there. 
So um, in twenty six in uh, in twenty uh, I believe twenty twenty one I believe last year twenty twenty one when we were trying to put us uh, things together, the Lord was prying. It was prying in my heart for me to quit to for me to quit my job, and I was getting a good job. I was a sheet metal worker by trade um, in, in California. Sheet metal worker by trade. Uh, in the union, they take care of their people. In California, they take care of their people. You get a hundred thousand plus a year being a sheet metal worker in California. A hundred thousand plus a year, and that's not including the overtime, all the other kickbacks that you get from working that job. So as I finished my five-year program, and I was like, you know what? I'm getting ready to make the big bucks. I'm getting ready to own that house. I'm getting ready to, you know, and buying a house in the Bay Area is really expensive. We're talking about a million plus. But I was like, okay, on my way to, you know, living a comfortable life. But God was prying on my, in my heart that being a student of the Word of God, there is a great need in Africa. So um, quitting my job wasn't an easy thing. My boss was like, you're crazy. But I was like, I have to follow God's will. So quitting my job, we put everything together. And uh, we went in September of last year. And uh, that's me and my beautiful wife. Uh, forget me, but my beautiful wife. And those are my four beautiful children right there. We have a fifth one that we came in February to have, baby Lily. So we have James Jr. Uh, right there on the right-hand side, and we have Abigail, and then we have Grace, and then we have Mary. So Jr. just turned eight, and then Mary is sick. Uh, Mary, uh, Abigail is sick, is six, and then Grace is two years old, and then uh, Mary is four years old, and then we have Baby Lily, who is three months year old, three months old. So all a family, a family of of seven going to Africa after being in, in the States for seven years, it's a big deal. <laughs> it's a big deal for a person who is, and for the men, I believe that you can attest to this, you know, in the back of your head, when you have a family, security comes first. Food on the table, roof over your head, clothes over your back, the medical expenses. I mean, all this has to be put into account, but taking all that and, and going to Africa to do the work of the Lord, it's a big deal. And that's only God can do that. God can only do that. And I don't know if you can step over to the next slideshow. So that's me with, um, uh, that's Pastor uh, Rhonda right there. We, we linked up with a, a, a church called Pentecostal Evangelical Fellowship of Africa. It's a big denomination. It's kind of like the Assemblies of God in Kenya. They are sound doctrinally. They are sound. They, their doctrine is so sound. And we linked up with them. And uh, they are doing a church plant. So that's them praying for us because his son, his name is Pastor Noah. You'll see his, uh, his picture on the, on the other slideshow. Uh, we're linking with him, and we are planting a church. As we speak, that church was planted like maybe two Sundays ago. So we will be missionary pastors, both me and my wife, in this church. So I don't know if you can step over to the next uh, picture. So that's us. Um, that's a miss missionary effort that we're distributing food to the uh, young people uh, that are over there, also teaching them, uh, te preaching and teaching the gospel to them. And also um, they have other programs to, uh, to help them to be uh, economically lucrative. Um, some other programs like carpentry or, or, or uh, steel work or this different types of things that they can get into, that it can get into in order to become financially stable. And I don't know if we can go to the next video, uh, next slideshow. That's us holding a Bible study together and uh, preaching and teaching the message of the cross. Um, if we can go to the other, other uh, picture. That's me um, doing school outreaches. I have to tell you this, Africa, in all honesty, uh, the government has taken a hands-off approach when it comes to the gospel in public schools. So in public schools, they allow you from elementary to all the way up to uh, elementary to middle school to uh, um, high school to college. They don't withhold the preaching of the gospel. They understand that morality, teaching the kids uh, the basics or the, uh, the, the semblance of the knowledge of God is important, even if probably some of them might accept Jesus and some of them might not, but they understand the importance of preaching the gospel. So those are, the, those are kids just responding to the move of God in that classroom, and I'm thankful that God is doing a great job in that school. I don't know if you can go to the other slideshow. Same thing, 
doing a great job over there. I like that handsome man just smiling, holding a Bible with a face mask. <laughs> Let's go over to the next picture. Those, that's the youth, the youth ministry that I was preaching to the youth. And a um, little, bit, little, bit, little bit of a brief story that before I went to Kenya, the Lord impressed upon my heart to preach, uh, to, to study the book of Ephesians. Not to, to read it, but to study it. Because this is the main problem that we find in Africa. Is that in, in, in America, we are so fortunate to have commentaries, to have great Bible teachers, to have great Bible programs, to have materials that you can get uh, in the click of a button on your phone. Uh, but in Kenya, we don't have the resources or the materials to teach people, teach and preach the message, the, the message of the gospel. But now they, for, for somebody like me who is growing up under Brother Swagger and, and learning and teaching and preaching the message of the cross, they glean from that. And they understand that the message of justification by faith, they're not saved by what they do. They're not saved by church attendance. They're not saved by the tithe that they put, put in or the offering that they put in on the offering plate. This is, the, this is the, the tragedy of some of the churches in Africa. I'll tell you this. So you find people in church, but they believe that since I've put in my money for uh, uh, paying the light bill or uh, paying for the seats on the, on the church or paying for this pulpit right here or buying different instruments, I am saved based on what I do. And that is the most unfortunate thing that people struggle with right now. Because me coming, me coming over there and preaching and teaching that you are only saved by grace and grace alone. For by grace we are saved through faith. And not, not by works, lest any man should boast. That's, that specific message right there is liberating, liberating to the people. Burdens are lifted let alone preaching about uh, uh, sanctification, because that's another aspect right there, because a lot of the people are in church struggling with different types of vices, struggling to uh, quit drugs, struggling to quit alcohol, tr struggling to quit different types of things. And uh, I want to put this out there, a small little caveat, because uh, we believe that, if, okay, in America, there's uh, something called mental health. They believe that if you go to uh, see a professional psychologist, so-and-so, that you can get uh, help if you struggle with these stuff. In third world countries, they don't have psychologists. They don't have psychiatrists. They don't have therapists. They only have Jesus. They only have Jesus. And Jesus is the only, is the only person that can help them to go through and to be delivered and set free from all the shackles and the pains and the vices of life. Sin here in America is the same as sin in Kenya. Sin in Africa, it's a moral issue. It's a moral problem. They struggle with it the same, same way we do over here. So there's no difference. So the same, same Jesus that is here presently right now as we speak is the same, same Jesus that will do his work of setting people free by the shed blood of Jesus Christ in Africa. Hallelujah. And uh, I don't know if we can go to the other. That's me preaching and teaching. But uh, I think I don't know if we can speed up to different pictures so that we can show um, the church that we're planting. That's us giving Bible distributions. Uh, giving the Bible to new believers, new converts. And uh, I don't know if you can go to the next one uh, and the next one. So this is the one, Church Plant House, House of Bread in Rye. So Rye is, is kind of like it's 30 minutes away from the capital city of Nairobi. That's where we're doing a church plant. And uh, if you can go to the next video. So that's, that's, the, that's the church building right there in its construction phase. There are no construction permits in Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> no such thing. So you pray that everything, there's no such thing as the building has to, up to, code, has to, be, has to be up to code. So <laughs> that's the building right behind us. If you can go on to the next picture, I think. So that's how it was. We gutted it uh, because the structure, was, the structure was structurally unsound and we're building it. But we don't have, I don't think we have, do you have another, is, that, is, that, is there another picture after that? So that's, we torn off the roof. We're redoing a whole bunch of stuff over there. Um, another, another picture, please. So that's, that's us trying to, the picture on the right, right hand side is us trying to do the construction of it, trying to make it all structurally sound. 
but I don't think we have the picture. We didn't, this is a presentation that we did when we came in February. But right now, as we speak, that church is, is done. We've already put in a brand new roof. We've already, we're putting in the windows. We, we're done putting in different types of um, uh, building structure to make it sound. And uh, it's operational. It's functional. Uh, we've already held two services, and that's where we're going August the 4th. So we've already uh, got the plane ticket. August the 4th is when we're going there to do the great work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're just grateful. We're just grateful that we're going there to be the hands and feet of, of, uh, of the gospel and what Jesus is trying to do um, over there. So uh, with that said and done, if you can allow me to go to my text, Pastor, it's almost 1030 if I'm not wrong. How many minutes do I have? Oh, I got plenty of time? Oh, okay, okay. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we'll go to the text, the reading of our text. If you have your Bibles, could you please turn with me to First Chronicles uh, verse 17, verse 1 to 14. If you will allow me, I, I'll read um, from the New King James. Um, And I believe by the end, by the end of these preaching, I believe that we will all be uh, edified. We will all be uplifted. Uh, we will all be blessed by what the Lord is wanting me to speak to this wonderful church. Amen. If you're there, please say amen. God's covenant with David. Now it came to pass when David was dwelling in his house. And David said to Nathan, the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar. But the, ark, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under tent, tent curtains. Then Nathan said to David, do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. Now, it's, it's a, a, I'll read, if you can allow me, I'll read about 14 verses all the way down to, get, to just get the full gist of what's taking place here. But I want to stop right there in verses, in, verses one, in verses 2, and we find the response of Prophet Nathan saying that, um, uh, telling David, do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. So one thing that I would like for us to learn as a body, as a body of Christ, is that sometimes uh, preconceived notions or presuppositions might land us into problems. Because sometimes we might assume that our will is in line with God's will, but it's not God's will, it's our will. My will was to come here into this country and to live a prosperous life, probably lead a Bible study of maybe two or three or five people and grow with them in Christ. But God had a different plan. He wanted me to go to Africa and he wanted me to preach the gospel to a lost and a dying world over there that are neck deep in religion. So sometimes just reading this, just reading up to verse two. Sometimes I think we need to check our will, and sometimes we have plans. We have plans, financial plans, social plans, uh, different types of plans that we have uh, uh, pertaining our finances. But this is the thing. Do we align or do we ask God about what we want to do? Is it God's will for my direction in life? I, I know this person that I love. I know this person that I want to get married to, but do we submit the plans to the Lord? And I believe that um, as we read in verses 3, we'll find out real quick what God kind of thought about the whole issue. Because this, is, was, this was a discussion between David and Prophet Nathan. And Nathan was in line. He was like, oh, yeah, go do all that is in your heart. But God had a different, different plan. God had a different opinion to say. They didn't ask God. They didn't involve God in this conversation. But God was ready to step in forcefully. Don't let God step in forcefully in your plans. <laughs> but thank God he does because we'll land ourselves into a ditch. Amen? Verse 3, it says, But it happened that night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, You shall not build me a house to dwell in. Then again, I want to say this, that I love that, that God told Nathan, to tell, uh, God told Nathan to, uh, uh, to tell my servant David. But this is the thing, because of the new covenant, we are more than servants. We are friends with God, hallelujah. We are friends with God. What greater love 
than a person would have for his, for what a greater love that a person would have than to lay down his life for a friend. Jesus is calling us friends. Amen. We are placed in a good covenant based on better promises. We are not servants, but we are friends with God, closer, closer to God, more than to be regarded as a servant. Hallelujah. I just wanted to throw in that point right there real quick. And verse 5, he says, for I, dwell, for I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought you up, up um, since the time that I brought you up Israel, uh, even to this day, but have gone from tent to tent, from one tabernacle to another, where I have moved about with all Israel. Have I ever spoken a word to any of, uh, to any of the judges of Israel whom I have commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, uh, fr uh, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. See what God can do? Hallelujah. See what God can do? He can take you from the back and put you to the front. Hallelujah. And I, and, and I have been, and I have been with you wherever you have gone and I've cut off all your enemies from before you and I've made you a name like the name of the great men who are on earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. Since the, time that I, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, also I will subdue all your enemies. Furthermore, I tell you that the Lord will build you a house, Hallelujah. The Lord will build you a house. That's a covenant. That's a covenant. Hallelujah. And it shall be when your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up you, uh, that I will set up, you, uh, that I will set up your seed after you, who will be your son, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. I will take I will, not take, I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him who was before you, uh, talking about Saul, and I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for today's reading. Understanding, oh Father God, Lord, the, the promise that you made, oh Father God, with your servant David. Thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, as we read this text, oh Father God, and as we go deep in it, O oh, Father, I pray, Lord, that we delve into it, O oh, Father God, understand it, O oh, Father God, and by the end of this service, O oh, Father God, we'll come out with what you want us to get from this text in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, for a great anointing, and I pray, Lord, for clarity of speech, O oh, Father God. I pray, Lord, for your wisdom as I preach this text. In Jesus' name, we pray and believe. Amen. Hallelujah. So, David, David at this time, God has given him great victory victory God has took uh, God took him from the sheepfold and he took away the kingdom and rulership away from Saul because of his disobedience because God instructed him to destroy the Amalekites but he didn't do that he he uh, left out King Agag and prophet Samuel says because of your disobedience the kingdom will be ripped out of your hand and give being given to somebody who is better then comes David and then it comes to the 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 eat lunch hallelujah so looking at this looking at this text it's talking about david's intention to build a temple but because he had the intention to build a temple, God, it wasn't God's will for him to build a temple. But because it stemmed from David's heart, God cut a covenant with him. And he said, I will, from your lineage, I will, I will build a throne. I will build the kingdom of, I will, I will set up, uh, I will set up the, the temple from your son. And I will establish his kingdom forever through his son, through his lineage. 
And this is a great covenant. Out of so many covenants that we have seen here, the, the great covenant that God cut with Abraham, the covenant that God cut with David that we're looking at right here, the covenant that God cut with uh, Moses and the children of Israel through the Mosaic law, and then the new covenant through Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. But through this covenant that we are examining here, God gave a promise to David, which will be fulfilled, hallelujah, when we come down with Jesus to rule and reign with him during the second coming. Hallelujah. And then I want to draw your attention also to um, 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Chronicles, sorry, 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verses 1, just to get a brief, brief background on what's going on here. 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. And it says, Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah where the Lord had appeared to his father at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite, or Aruna the Jebusite. So honestly, this is talking about a special place, the designated special place in Mount Moriah that God, that the um, uh, Solomon built the temple at that specific spot. This is a very spot that David did a sacrifice because he held a census that wasn't supposed to be held. He held a census to, throughout the whole kingdom of the, the children of Israel. And even his very general, Joab, the son of Zeruiah, told him, tried to tell him, don't, don't do this. Don't do this censor. You're bringing wrath and condemnation to the children of Israel. But David didn't want to do it. Didn't want to listen to his uh, um, servant, to his servant Joab, but he did a census. But at that time, when he did a census, he realized the faultiness of what he did in his heart. And he said, God, forgive me for my foolishness. And then prophet, the prophet Gad came to him and he told him, hey, choose three things. Number one, you can either choose to have a famine for seven years. Or number two, you can either choose to be in, your enemy should pursue you for three months. Or number three, you could have the a plague come in for three days. And uh, can you imagine God giving you three poisons and he tells you to pick one? <laughs> pick one, pick one. <laughs> so, so that was a tough call for David. That was a tough call for David. But he said, God, I just want to fall into the hands of God. I don't want to fall into the hands of man, but I want to fall in the hands of God. And 70,000 children of Israel were killed by the angel of the Lord. But the angel of the Lord stood at Aruna the Jebusite and his threshing floor. And he stood right there. And at that time, David came over and saw the angel suspended in between the heavens and the earth. And prophet, and he wanted to plead, and he pleaded, and he acted as a, an intercessor at this time. He acted as a type of Christ, interceding for the children of Israel and saying, God, I did this. It's my fault. Let this, be, let this punishment, let this plague be upon me and upon my house, but not upon the children of Israel. So right at that point, you see David acting as a type of Christ. But at that point, prophet Gad told him, make a sacrifice. Make a sacrifice to the Lord our God. And at that point right there, he bought the threshing, threshing floor from Ornan or Aruna the Jebusite. Because Ornan wanted to give him for free. He said, you can take my oxen, you can take my, the yoke, and you can build an altar, and you can sacrifice to the Lord. And he said, I will not take something for free that has not costed me, any, that has not costed me anything to give to the Lord. So he bought it. He bought the piece of land. And that, that's the... Prime, that's this very spot that Solomon built the temple. And that temple is with us right now, the Dome of the Rock. That very spot that we see right now, the Dome of the Rock, that's the exact place where David cut a covenant with the Lord for the sparing of the children of Israel because that angel wanted to kill the people who are dwelling in Jerusalem. And also it says this, I don't know, probably I'll run my notes with uh, uh, Pastor Matt, that that's the very spot that uh, Abraham wanted to sacrifice his son Isaac at Mount Moriah. That's the very spot. So you see the consistency of what Abraham did, the very specific place, how, Abra how David cut a covenant with the Lord right there. And that's the place where Solomon built, Solomon built the temple of the Lord, where it stays right now as we speak. And that's the very place that the Lord will build the, king, the, the temple that will come when we rule and reign with him. Hallelujah. So you see the connection? 
that it flows from that story. Hallelujah. And then it says uh, from that point that God told David, his son, that he will build him a temple. So, and we see that David, if looking at the two kings here in contrast, we see that David kind of typifies like a, typifies Christ as a man of war. And when, they, and when Solomon comes into the picture, he typifies Christ during his reign of peace. Because when you read the whole entire life of Solomon, Solomon's reign was, man, man I mean, Israel was prosperous. I mean, I am blown away by reading. I mean, I, I believe that, that at that time, Israel was the first world country at that time because gold was, silver was nothing. Gold was nothing. But that time, I mean, he was wealthy. He was rich. I mean, God blessed him tremendously. And I believe that he typified Christ when he comes and rules and reigns during the kingdom age. And I want to say this um, Real quick, that the way God used Solomon to build his house, the way God used Solomon to build his house, who is building the house that is in our hearts? Who is building the house that is in our, that is in our hearts? We understand that since we are children, the blessed children who have come into the new covenant, the Lord is building in us. We are the temple of the Lord, and the Lord, I'm kind of getting my, ahead of myself, the Lord is building in us a temple. But I love the scripture in Psalms 127 that says, unless the Lord builds the house, unless the Lord builds your house, do you build your house by self-will? Do you build your house by your own talents, by your own machinations, by your own uh, um, self-effort? But if the Lord builds the house, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. So I just want to put, it, put this out there that who builds your house as we speak? Who is building your life? Is it your financial decisions that builds your life? Is it your um, intellectuality that builds your life? Is it your um, um, self-wit that builds your life? Is it your preconceived notions that build your life? Or is it the Lord that builds your life? Hallelujah. So one of the take home is that let the Lord build your house. Let the Lord build your life. Let him have reins. Let him have control over your life. But don't take control. Don't start assuming that you can know how to do this. This is the thing, even in my life as a missionary, and it's not easy because sometimes even going to a third world country, going back to Africa, yes, this is a country that I grew up in, but I've been away for eight years, and that country has changed. It has changed. And uh, I can say this right now. That country is, is under the thumbprint of the Chinese Communist government. Every time, you, it, when you go to Kenya right now, you see the Chinese Communist flag flying in that country. And I'm wondering why. Because they have done billions of billions, billions of dollars building the infrastructure in that third world country. They have taken a vested interest in building that country. So they've dumped billions. So my country is neck deep in debt. To the, Kenyan gov to the Chinese government. I think we can edit that part out. <laughs> They're going to come after me. <laughs> but so, you, so that country has changed, and they need the gospel. They need the gospel. And I need the direction of the Holy Spirit. And I, and I need the discerning of the Holy Spirit. What to do, what to say, who to talk to, who to associate. Because I need the leading of the Lord because I'm not going in by myself. I have my wife and I have my kids. And I need the discerning, the discernment of the Lord to lead me and guide me as I am in Kenya. The same, same way, both, all of us need the leading and the guiding of the Lord in our own personal lives. Hallelujah. So I want to look at the temple here and I want to go through this real quick and I'm fa I, honestly I'm really fascinated by the temple I was fascinated by the tabernacle but looking at the temple I'm just fascinated by it the the articles of worship how the structure of the temple is I mean it's just amazing that that when you when you look at the altar the altar itself it was 30 feet by 30 feet and the altar right there that typified Christ's sacrificial offering on the cross that Lambs were offered when Solomon dedicated the temple. Temple, Thousands and thousands of lambs were offered. Thousands of lambs were offered when he dedicated that temple. And the, temp and the presence of the Lord was so overwhelming in that temple that even the priests could not go into that temple because the Lord was in that temple. Is your heart filled with the Spirit of God? 
that you cannot contain yourself, that you come unglued when you come into the presence of God? Is your heart like that? That even the priest could not enter into that temple because the glory of the Lord was so heavy in that place. And it all started but when they sacrificed, when they gave sacrifice and an offering to the Lord. That offering, and I love what Brother Swaggart says. Brother Swaggart says this, that that offering kind of typifies what Christ would do on the cross. But also, he touched on another thing that said the whole burnt offering typified the perfection of Christ. The whole burnt offering that they did, uh, typifying the perfection of Christ, is the perfection of Christ given to us for free. I didn't have to do anything to earn it, but God gives me his perfection. He takes away all my inconsistencies, all my failures, everything that I struggle with. He takes it and he gives me his righteousness. And I'm glad that God has given me this righteousness. There are so many things that we can look at, especially when it comes to the articles of the temple. We have the brazen laver that had the six, that had the 12 cows right underneath it. It has the, 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 the molten sea. It has the brazen laver. When you go into, it, when you go on, on the vestibule, on the portico, you have the two uh, pillars, Jake, uh, J, uh, Boaz and Jachin. When you go in, you have the, the, uh, the lampstands, two, ten lampstands, five on the right and five on the left. You have the table, the table of showbread. You have the bread that typified Christ in there. That is the holy place. And then you have the big veil. And then the altar of incense right before the Holy of Holies. And when you go to the Holy of Holies, you see the tabernacle right there. And you have the two angels that were the seraphims that were, in, that were uh, designed, that were 30 feet tall. And the wingspan seven and a half inch wide that touched the wall. And their wings were touching each other. I mean, if you look at the temple itself, I mean, it's just magnificent. But I want to draw your attention on one thing that really piqued my attention with all the articles of the temple. This is the thing that, that took, picked, piqued my interest, is the two pillars that were right there. So this is, what, this is what, when I was doing my homework, this is what I saw, that the two pillars were made out of brass and were strictly ornamental. In fact, one was called Jachin, which means, God will, God, which means he will establish you, and the second one was named Boaz, which means he will strengthen you. And um, going about with the two pillars, the two pillars were 52 uh, feet high with seven, seven, seven feet and a half uh, capita, and it had a total, uh, it had a total length span, uh, a length of 60 feet. And one thing that I love about these two pillars right here, above all the articles in the, in the temple, these two pillars kind of like, like struck a chord in my heart. Because the network of the chains that was on it, that was done by uh, Huram. Huram was the person who was uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit to do the artifacts of the, the articles in there. It says that uh, the, the network typifies our union with Christ that was in these pillars. It typified our union with Christ. And on the network, there was pomegranates, the fruit, typifying the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We should have all the fruits of the Spirit in understanding and knowing where we place our faith in. The object of our faith being in Christ and what Christ did on the cross. But this is the best thing. And uh, if you forget my, uh, my whole sermon, please remember this. That this pillar represents each and every one of us. This is what Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, verses 21. He says, for he who overcomes, he who overcomes, and we need to overcome in this world that we see here right now. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. That means that you will become a pillar in the temple temple of the Lord God Almighty and he and he shall go out no more and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from God and I will write on him a new name a new name that means that there will be a new name written on you for them who overcomes the question is are you an overcomer are you an overcomer? They overcame them with the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, and they loved not their lives. Are you an overcomer? Are you an overcomer? They overcame them with the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives. Hallelujah. If you are an overcomer, it's a guarantee 
that he will make you a pillar in the temple of God. I don't know if that excites you, but that excites me. That I'm not a nobody. I am somebody. <laughs> I am not a nobody. I am somebody. That because of me believing in Jesus Christ, practicing simple faith in Christ, that I am a pillar in the temple of the Lord. That, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. That is amazing. That, that pillar right there that was built by um, um, Solomon, typifies me. And you know, this is something that Jesus said this to the church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3. And because Philadelphia at that time, it, 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 it was ravaged by earthquakes. It was ravaged by a lot of earthquakes. So the, 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 the thing that people did during that time of earthquake, people left the city and people came back to a place that was ruined, decimated and desolated by the earthquakes. But this is what God, this is Jesus telling them this is Jesus telling them, and, 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 and he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he, shall, and he shall go out no more. That means that you will be so stable. You will be so stable that you will not go out, 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 not go out. and establish stability and establishment establishment and strength you will be established in Christ if you understand where you place your faith in the finished work of the Lord God Almighty hallelujah if, if you haven't gotten anything please get that hallelujah that you are somebody in the presence of the Lord that you are established in the kingdom of the Lord you are this pillar that is established in the kingdom of the Lord because you believe in Christ you believe in God, believe also in me. Hallelujah. I, I, I'm excited about that. I read that and I was like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not, no, I'm, I'm not a nobody. I am somebody. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I want to bring this home real quick is that, so the, 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 the gold that David, during his administration, the gold that he amassed from conquering his enemies, he used it. He used it to make the articles and the furnishings. Uh, under Solomon, he made, he, Solomon made the articles and the furnishings that went into this temple that I've just um, kind of ran through real quick. But these were stuff, these were gold that were used in heathenistic worship, in idolatrous worship. But God, but see here, David used it and Solomon used it for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means that even if, even if you were a mess, even if you're past, if you think about your life, if you think about how you were before you got into salvation, that means even if you made mistakes, God will still use you. God will still use you. God will not throw you out. Sometimes I believe the devil comes in and uh, uh, um, kind of whispers in our ear that uh, we're not living right. We messed up over there. We said words that we're not supposed to say. We did things that we're not supposed to do. We saw things that we're not supposed to see. We practiced some things that we're not supposed to practice. And the devil comes in and he says that God's through with you. You're not, you're not a child of God. You might as well give up in this whole salvation, this whole Christianity. You might as well just give up. But this is the thing. If God used the heathenistic gold articles that were back in the day and he used it for the temple of the Lord, that means that God can use you and your mess and your pasts and he can use you as a prized possession in the kingdom of the Lord. He can set you up in his kingdom. He can use you as a pillar and establish you in the presence of God. So some people might are ashamed of looking at our past. Sometimes I'm not proud of my mistakes. I'm not proud of my past. But sometimes I use my past to encourage somebody who's going through what I went through. To tell him, hey, I made the mistakes you've made. I did those things that you did. I was about to walk away from relationships. I was about to walk away from different things that would mess that that would build my life. I was about to walk away from my family. I was about to walk away from my home. I was about to do a whole lot of things that would destroy me. But I didn't do it because Jesus Christ came in and stepped in. And and if he helped me he can help you the same way you don't have to quit on your life you don't have to quit on your on on your marriage you don't have to quit on anything but you can trust God and God will see you through hallelujah hallelujah and I want to bring a spiritual application to this just we've dealt with the the physical application but I want to deal with the spiritual one real quick and uh, I love what uh 
Jesus, his discussion that he had with his disciples, and he said, talking with his disciples in John 14, 16, John 14, 16, he said, I will pray, and I will pray the Father, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you a helper, that he may abide with you forever. Not temporarily, not when you're good, not when you, you know, when you get it right, and then when you fall, he kind of steps away, but he will abide with you forever. That typifies the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. The salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. If we are united in the likeness of his death, he shall also be with us in the likeness of our resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man has been crucified with Christ. That resurrection power, the Holy Spirit that resurrected us from the dead as soon as we said yes to Jesus Christ, is still in us right now. I like what, uh, I like what uh, uh, this, um, uh, what's this uh, scholar, uh, this scholar that I'm, me and uh, Pastor Matt have talked about him, Kenneth Weiss. That Kenneth Weiss, uh, he's a uh, Pastor Matt is a is a big fan of that, fan of that guy. He says we function from a new power source. We function from a new power source, and that power source being the Holy Spirit functioning in us will help us to live a holy and a righteous life every single day. Why am I emphasizing this? Why am I emphasizing this? Because when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes into our life and abides with us permanently. Because when you look at the temple. In between the seraphims, the mercy seat, the Holy Spirit resided there. That means the temple typified a place where the presence of God consistently dwelt. Consistently dwelt. That means the picture that we should look upon ourselves is that we are the temple of the Lord. We are this temple. The, the, just a few minutes that I've taken to explain what the temple is in the physical realm, how it was way back when, 3,000 years ago when Solomon built it. But we are that temple. That was a physical presence, physical pre presentation, but we are the temple right now spiritually because it has been established in our hearts. That's what Jesus did on the cross. That's what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection. Hallelujah. And this is what, this is what Paul kind of supports my, my thesis. Yeah, Paul kind of supports me when I, say, <laughs> when I say this. 1 Corinthians 3.16, it says, Do you not know, do you not know that you are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you? The Spirit of God dwells in us right now. It don't matter what you're feeling right now. It don't matter if you're happy. It don't matter if you're sad. It don't matter if you're up. It don't matter if you're down. What, it, what matters is that the Spirit of God dwells in you. That should make somebody happy. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Almighty God, the triune Godhead is dwelling inside us. Who am I? Who am I? that the Spirit of God will dwell in me. I'm a person who is so much, I mean, I do so many things that I, I just, I just, it's, it's unbelievable. My wife is, usually tells me, are you really saved because you said some stuff that you shouldn't say, you did some stuff that you shouldn't do. But it, it, it's amazing that the Spirit of God still deals with somebody like me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and, and one thing that I want to just bring out real quick is that the Lord told David that he is able to build him a house through the lineage that is in Jesus Christ. We ourselves should remember that the Lord desires to build us a house and do it. And to do it, the Lord needs a willing mind and an obedient heart. A willing mind and an obedient heart. Uh, I love what I was having a conversation with uh, Paris Reagan and he was telling me that he listened to David Borg and he said, it's not a matter of the Holy Spirit coming down from heaven because it came through Pentecost. But it's a matter of the Holy Spirit rising up in us. Yes. Hallelujah. It's about the Holy Spirit rising up in us. Because we have, we have taken control of our lives that the Holy Spirit has stepped aside. And that's why so many times, that's why we don't feel the presence of the Lord in our lives. Because we have taken leadership and control of our lives. But when we sidestep and let the Holy Spirit take the reins of our lives, we will be constantly dwelling. We will be constantly experiencing the presence of the Lord every single day of our lives. When we go to the gas station, when we do our life, when we raise up our kids, when we do, when we do different things, the Holy Spirit will constantly, we will, un, we will, be under the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Spirit 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's not, like, it's not like he's not there. He is there. But the question is, is he leading you? Hallelujah. Is he leading you? And this is the thing that I want to throw in a notion. Uh, um, I want to throw in a, 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 a caution real quick is that 
do we defile this temple? Do we defile this temple? Because now we understand that we are the temple of the Lord. Now we understand that the Spirit of God dwells in us. Now we understand that the, how the Holy Spirit dwelt between the, cherub, between the cherubims and the mercy seat. Do we, are we, do, do we uh, um, um, defile this temple? And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17, it says, If anyone defiles the temple of the God, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For example, God is holy, and the temple which temple you are. For the temple of God is holy, and the temple you are. So this is a caution that I want to throw in, that I want to throw out there. That we are the temple of God and we should not defile it. We should not defile it by what we see, we should not defile it by what we say. Even though we understand that Christ died on the cross and we, us placing our faith in in him and in, in, in placing our faith in him and what he did on the cross gives the holy spirit the the avenue to work in our lives that doesn't mean that we should live the way we should live we should understand that we are the temple of the lord and we should be sacred and holy in his sight hallelujah romans 6 romans 12 chapter 1 romans 12 chapter 1 it says i beseech you brethren therefore by the mercies of god that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to god which is your reasonable your reasonable service to fail to function in god's prescribed order is to open up satan to come and destroy our lives so it, this is something that that we have to understand to allow the holy spirit to consistently work within our lives to allow the holy spirit to continually permeate our lives what are we doing with the understanding that we are the temple of the lord what are we doing with that understanding do we just take it with a whole hum attitude, with a whole hum approach that, okay, since I'm the temple of the Lord, hey, I'm a, I will live the way I want to live. I'll do the things that I want to do. I'll say the things that I want to say. I'll spend my money on the things that I'll spend my money. I'll watch the things that I want to watch. And I'm not trying to be legalistic in any way, shape, or form, but I'm trying to draw a point that understanding that we, through the new covenant, we're in Christ and we are the temple of the Lord that also brings a, a caution that we, knowing that the sacredness and the holiness of the temple because God destroyed the temple because they were married into idolatry. They placed it, they shifted their faith in Christ and what he did at the cross, and they brought in idolatry. That's when Jeremiah or Ezekiel or every other prophet that warned them for the destruction of the temple, they didn't heed to it, and that's why they were carried away to Babylon. And the temple was destroyed, was leveled to the ground. The same, same temple that we're talking about here, that the presence of God was so strong that the, that the priests could not enter into that place. That place was left desolate because they defiled the temple of the Lord. With the understanding that we are the temple of the Lord, we should understand also what, we, what are we doing with that temple. There is, no negating of our, there is no negating of our awareness and our responsibility of the new covenant that God has given it, and to us. We can't negate it. We can't set it aside. We have to understand also that, yes, we should be mindful of our lifestyle. We should be mindful of how we live. Because how we live is a testimony to the people that are out there. We say we're Christians, but do we walk as Christians? Do we talk as Christians? Do we function as Christians? Because a lot of people, we are the Bible that they read. Yes. With your lifestyle, that would make your neighbor, your friend, your family, your coworker who's out there uh, come into the, to this church. Because they see Jesus in you, and they say, I want what you have. And they will come here, and they'll say, I want to have the Jesus that you have, because that Jesus that you have has changed you, and I want him to change me in Jesus' name. I want him to change me, hallelujah. I want him to change me. And I, and I, and I want to uh, just bring this to a close real quick, and if I, if I, Taking a brief time, I'm sorry. <laughs> if, I mean, if, I, if, I've, if I've gone over my time more. So I want to bring this to a close by saying this, that, that um, we're holy by the virtue of what Christ did on the cross. And we remain holy because of the work of the Holy Spirit who demands that we place our faith in Christ and what he did on the cross. And I want to say this real quick. In Africa, and I don't want to assume, I really don't want to assume that people do here, whether in this church or any church in America, but I, this, I want to just say this in, 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 in Kenya. This is how people think. This is how people do church over there. So with the understanding of the temple and understanding that we are containers, we are vessels of the Spirit of God, we kind of believe in Africa, we believe that, hey, uh, I will come to this church and the Holy Spirit is here. Because it's in this building, this, the physical structural building of this church. The Holy Spirit is here. So I want to come to church. I want to attend church because the Holy Spirit is here. 
But when church is over and when we go out to eat or to go to our restaurants or to go to our respective places, we think that we left the Holy Spirit here. That people in, in my country, they always think that, that, oh, yeah, the, the whole place, not, and I'm not saying that the, the building is not sacred or the building is not a place where people meet. Do not forsake the gathering of the brethren. But people don't, they, that idea of we are the containers, we are the vessels of the Holy Spirit, that we can take the Holy Spirit in the restaurant place that we eat, in the living room that we're at, in the bedroom that we sleep in, in the, our lifestyle that we, that we live, we think that we live, we, we, we leave the Holy Spirit right here. But the Holy Spirit is, is with us whithersoever we go. He's with us everywhere, everywhere, everywhere that we go. So it's not this, check this out. It's not that, that when we come here, it's, it's when we feel and experience the presence of the Lord. It's, it's when, when you go home and you are in God the whole entire week and we come here on Sunday. My gosh, it's an explosion. Because the, the Holy Spirit is so strong in you. The Holy Spirit is so strong in her. The Holy Spirit is so strong in all of us that we can't even stand up. We are worshiping for hours. We are praying for hours. We are crying out to God for hours because we are full of the Holy Spirit every single day. And when we come to church, it's an explosion. Hallelujah. It's an explosion. We don't come to the house of God to experience God. We've experienced God all the way out, and we come in to just thank God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So with our understanding, because sometimes we come to church and we're like, oh, I don't, you know, the pastor didn't get to me today, or the worship didn't get to me today, or this didn't get to me today. But if you were there, in your house, in your home, in the privacy of your home, in the, in, at work, and you're in God 24 hours a day, seven days a week, when you come here, it's an explosion. It's an explosion because you have the Holy Spirit. He's not put in the back burner and then on Sunday he's kind of put at the forefront, okay, Holy Spirit, do your thing. No, he is there constantly so that when the unbeliever comes here, he's like, my gosh. My gosh, there are people who know God. There are people who serve God. There are people who walk in the Spirit. There are people who are under the anointing and under the unction of the Holy Spirit 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that goes both ways, both in our personal lives and, and also functioning in the gifts of the Spirit. Hallelujah. That's what, <laughs> that means that when we're in the Spirit all the time, all day, every day, uh, we won't let the outside external stuff come into this temple and defile it and defile it because right now i mean oh, and i want to say this i've been in this country for seven years i'm going eight and i've seen the country turn on its head and i've seen the stuff that's going on right here and it's it's disheartening you know and i'll tell you this um with with the whole with the whole um social movement that's going on around somebody who's coming from a third world country has a different eye than the people that's going on over here. So that means I don't, you know, ingest all the lies that I see, everything. Because I, coming from where I came from and the background that I came from and coming over here, I see what's going on here. And I'm saying this is all a bunch of baloney. And I'm like, I appreciate this country. I love the flag. I love this nation. I love everything that this nation stands for. There's some things that people can debate about, but I'll say, uh, but I'll say this. This country has been good to me for the seven years that I've been here. This country is being 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 this country with us at Calvary because he told the fulfillment of what he told David is yet to come and we'll see it hallelujah but right now we're living in the grace period we're living in the we're living in the in the in the uh, in the dispensation of grace knowing that what Christ did on the cross is going to help us to live right function right and also walk in the gifts of the spirit hallelujah so let's rise up on our feet singers musicians if you can please make your way And I just want us to, uh, before I surrender the mic over to um, the pastor, I would like for you to examine yourself and examine your heart real quick. Um, Paul said, examine yourself to see, to see if, you're whether, if, if whether you're in the faith. So I want to ask you this question. Is the Holy Spirit at the forefront of your life? 
Is the triune Godhead at the forefront of your life? Is he taking leadership and he, is he taking a role in your life? And if he is not, I believe that he should take first place, first preeminence in your life, in every aspect of our life, so that we can not only get victory in our own personal life, but also we can be a people that preaches Jesus Christ to the lost. Hallelujah. And we can function in the gifts. Hallelujah. So just raising up our hands and just having a time of prayer and just asking God, God, please let your spirit reign in me. Let your spirit, Lord, I pray, Lord, that help me, Lord, to be full of the spirit. Hallelujah. Help the Holy Spirit to permeate my life and my heart and my soul and my spirit. Help me, oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, to walk in the Spirit, oh, Father God, to not take a, to not take a, a, a ho-hum approach, to not, to not just sit on the sidelines, hallelujah, but to allow the Holy Spirit, to allow the Spirit of God to take residence, to allow the Holy Spirit to take control of my life in Jesus' name, to allow, hallelujah, for me to place my faith where it needs to be, hallelujah. For me to understand the sacrifice that you the sacrifice that you made at Calvary, hallelujah. To understand that through that sacrifice, hallelujah, that we can have relationship with you, hallelujah. That we can have relationship with Father God and our union with you is strong, hallelujah. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray, Lord, for the brothers and the sisters that are here, Heavenly Father, Lord. With everything that they're going through in their personal life, hallelujah. With the, with the sickness and disease of Father God that some of them may be going through with, Heavenly Father, Lord. That you would touch their lives, hallelujah. That you would move in this church, of oh Father God, like you've never moved before, hallelujah. Lord, that you would touch us, oh Father God, and that you would change us, change our motivations, change our desires, oh Father God, to be solely focused, oh Father God, in you, and not upon ourselves, hallelujah, not upon our, not upon our own self-gratification, but upon, oh Father God, Lord, the, what you did on the cross, oh Father God, in, in putting you, in put in us new desires, in putting us, Lord, a new hope, in putting us, oh Father God, a new desire, Father God, a new drive, oh Father God, to run after you, hallelujah, and not to run, oh Father God, Lord, upon our own self-will, hallelujah. Oh Lord, we give you thanks and we give you praise, hallelujah. Thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, for we are a temple of the Lord, hallelujah. Lord, we are your temple, oh Father God, Lord, you are a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you, hallelujah. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we have the Holy Spirit who abides in us forever. Hallelujah. Thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord. We thank you and we worship you. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. We thank you, oh, Father God. Oh, Lord, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We glorify your holy name. Oh, hallelujah. We praise you, Heavenly Father, Lord, for what you're doing in us and through us. Hallelujah. We thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, for the victory that you're performing in our lives, oh, hallelujah. Oh, Lord, we glorify you. We thank you, oh, hallelujah. Lord, we give you glory and we praise you, oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you.